Tuesday, so be sure to uh, come to that. Then we're at the end of the semester, so we've had a really, really uh, packed uh, seminar series this spring, which has been excellent. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to uh, Dr. Keller and Joe, and they can tell you more about Joe, and Joe's going to talk about uh, his seminar today, all right? So. Okay, well, this is great. I'm, um, my pleasure to um, actually introduce my student, Joe. So, <laughs> Joe Sprocker has been with our lab and the department for, what, almost five years? And a little of Joe's history, for those of you that don't know. Um, Joe's a California boy, and he got, I mean, you were born there too, right? I was. Yeah, he was, okay. And um, I guess of the pertinent things, he has told me often, and I do remember, that he was turned off of science from some abysmal Disney programs early in his life. However, I think they might have set up another one of your skills I'm going to get to shortly. Um, but what Joe did do in some of his work um, where he's uh, working for a living, working in a vet school, and so forth, actually rekindled some of his interests in science. And he went to the University of California, Santa Cruz, and got a degree in, actually, what was your degree in? Plant sciences. Plant sciences. Thank you, Joe. Um, and now, what Joe, Joe has been doing some fantastic work in the lab. And I'm not going to be talking about that too much because I don't want to steal his thunder. However, what I did want to say, and I needed to, uh, I don't, I rarely have a chance to say this except to this audience, that you are going to see that Joe's done a fantastic job on his research. There's no doubt that highly skilled. I hope you enjoy his talk very much. But he has another talent, and it's one that is groaningly appreciated by our lab and probably many others. And that is his, his talent in the pun. <laughs> so my daughter has enjoyed these um, little uh, sayings from Joe for many years, and I told her that you were giving your um, seminar talk today, and she said, well, I want you to tell Joe something. So here we are. Joe, <laughs> can a matchbox? No, but a tin can. Uh, <laughs> 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 you don't think too long on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Nancy. Um, thanks everyone for coming on the Thursday seminars. I uh, get very uh, attended, so I appreciate you all taking some more time out this week. Um, so I put this statement up here, which I'll get to in a minute, just for you to read while you're drinking coffee and waiting. And, uh, but uh, the title of my talk is Inner Kingdom Chemical Communication Mediates uh, Intimate Bacterial Fungal Interactions. Um, so it's kind of a broad title, um, but I'll be talking about uh, kind of a select set of experiments that is getting at this uh, general idea. Um, but what I wanted to point out with this statement is that um, you know, bacteria and fungi have uh, been interacting for billions of years. Um, and we know relatively little about how they interact outside of antibiosis. Um, and so one part of my research is kind of to get a better idea of some of these interactions that aren't necessarily just killing one another, but are instead uh, maybe a little more complex um, and may actually uh, contribute to different outcomes other than anti antibiosis. So, uh, oh, and this final statement is just that, uh, you know, we may actually start thinking about things aside of just, hey, I want to you know, use some compound from this microbe to kill that microbe, but instead we might start, uh, you know, using what we call antibiotics instead to modulate communities um, and have different outcomes other than just wiping someone out of an, an uh, ecosystem or an environment. So, uh, just as a quick outline of my talk, I'll just give you a brief introduction of bacterial fungal interactions, generally very broad, um, and just talk to you about some of these modes of communication and outcomes. Um, and then I'll go into the research that I've been doing, which has involved uh, some volatile signaling uh, between bacteria and fungi, uh, some diffusible metabolites that are uh, we think communication signals. Um, and then I'll, I'll go into a little bit of a fungal response that we've documented 
um, in response to one of these bacterial communication compounds. And then we'll get into some conclusions afterwards. Um, so like I said, uh, first thing we'll talk about is uh, bacterial fungal interactions. Uh, so as I mentioned before, these are uh, a very broad topic. You can think about all of the bacteria and all of the fungi and all of the different one-to-one -one interactions that might occur. Um, and there has been lots of research on these one-to-one -one interactions, um, which is what I'll be presenting today. Um, but some of the modes that have been documented in these variety of systems are volatile interactions, so these are compounds that move through airspace, uh, diffusible signals, which would move through aqueous environments, um, which you could think might be uh, pertinent to uh, rhizosphere or soil uh, microenvironments, um, and then direct physical interactions where bacteria and fungi are physically touching, um, and um, this even includes interactions where there might be bacteria inside of fungi. Um, and I've listed uh, just some of the potential outcomes. I'm sure you could imagine other ones if you were just to think about uh, any other ecological systems. Um, but the one that I, I've highlighted is antibiosis because that's really uh, where I think we start looking at bacterial fungal interactions. Um, if you go back to Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillium. Um, but there are other uh, interactions that uh, are, are pertinent uh, to think about, such as predation of bacteria and fungi, um, transitions that might uh, result from these interactions uh, in terms of morphology, like spore production or biofilm uh, initiation. Um, other things that we, you know, that have been documented are shifts in physiology, um, metabolite output, um, changes in modes of dispersal. Um, so some bacteria have been shown to actually ride on hyphae um, to move through uh, soil environments. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, endosymbiotism. So some bacteria are known to get inside of fungi. To my knowledge, there's no fungi that get inside of bacteria. I think it's kind of a size issue. Um, but uh, so these are just, again, general bacterial fungal interactions. And so um, this is just to paint the picture of uh, what I've been working on over the past five years. Um, so what I, what I really am interested in is kind of a one-to-one -one interaction, or what the work I've been doing has been, you know, single bacterium, a single fungus. Um, and what I've been trying to get at is uh, what are the compounds used in these interactions, and also some of the genes that might be involved in either making the compounds or how uh, fungi are responding to uh, the signals from the bacteria. So as the model bacterium that I've been using for this work, uh, I'm using Ralstonia solanaceorum, and you guys already know a lot about this because uh, Tuan's presentation earlier uh, in the semester, uh, but I'll give you just again a, a brief background. Um, so it's obviously a devastating plant pathogen. Um, it's a gram-negative uh, microbe that is, uh, actually forms a species complex. So what is Ralstonia solanaceorum um, is actually likely multiple species that are all kind of clumped into this one pathogenic complex. Uh, it can affect over 200 plant species, including monocots and dicots. Uh, the way it infects its, its host is it uh, goes through the roots and then it, uh, colonizes the xylem, where it uh, occludes water transport and causes wilting. Uh, as far as its overwintering or survival outside of the plant, uh, there is uh, some documentation of it being able to survive in low numbers in soil, as well as in waterways, and also in uh, dead plant tissue. Uh, and I just put this statement here uh, just because I'm letting you know that I'm, I'm building on a, a small body of work that indicates that it does produce uh, bioactive uh, metabolites or small molecules. Um, and these pictures here just diagram some of that EPS of the bacterium streaming out of a cut uh, plant here. This is an image of the wilting of the tomato plant. And then this is a good picture of something I'll talk about later, which is, it kind of looks very snotty, and that is actually extracellular polysaccharide that is produced by Ralstonia, and that's uh, the primary means that it uses to occlude uh, xylem tissue. So also just to add to just a little bit of background, since I'll be talking about kind of a variety of metabolites, I've put just a diagram of microbial volatiles up here. And these are uh, what I'll talk about very briefly. Uh, my volatiles are usually small uh, molecular weight compounds that can diffuse readily through air. Um, they can vaporize relatively easily, move 
long distances and then can uh, affect an organism uh, you know, over meters or further. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about diffusible signals, which again are going to be things that would not be moving necessarily through the air, but would instead go through aqueous solution. It might affect microbes that are within you know, a couple of millimeters to centimeters uh, generally. So the scale is important when thinking about some of these interactions. Um, again, in here, uh, there's a little bit of information. Uh, I'll just talk to you. You don't necessarily need to see what's in here. Um, but I want to point out that some of these diffusible signals are made through different means. Uh, some are, are made actually from amino acids, but they aren't necessarily proteins. They're peptides that are put together by um, uh, biosynthetic enzymes called non-ribosomal peptide synthases. Um, so they incorporate amino acids into small molecules. Uh, and then uh, other ones are called uh, polyketide synthases, and they incorporate uh, acyl-CoA units. Uh, to form polyketides such as uh, aflatoxins. So that's just a little bit of background, but I really want you to remember that the amino acids can go into non-ribosomal peptides. Okay, so to discuss some of the volatile signaling work I've done. Uh, in this interaction, uh, what we did is we uh, did a setup that you can see here. Uh, this is basically one large Petri plate with smaller Petri plates set inside. And we in, uh, inoculated fungi uh, on the top and bottom, bacteria, which is Ralstonia solanaceorum, on the two sides. Uh, and these are axenic cultures. So you can see how they grow on their own. The fungi produce a lot of canidia, which is the green that you see here, and those are spores that are produced by the fungus. And uh, Ralstonia produces a lot of um, uh, melanin, which is that brown color. And you can also see some of the uh, EPS production as well. And then when we grow them in co-culture, what you see here is basically no canidiation and a significant reduction in the melanin production and EPS that is produced. Um, and so this was a very interesting phenotype that we sought to characterize further. Uh, we did quantify uh, all of these, these phenotypes that we saw um, and they held up that there was not practically no canidiation in these cultures. Uh, because of this uh, very severe response to volatile co-culture, uh, we decided to look at the seed as well to see if uh, on the natural host of Aspergillus flavus uh, if we'd still see a reduction in canidiation. Uh, and in fact we did. So this is our controls which is just Aspergillus flavus uh, on, on seed uh, next to a blank media plate. So there should not be any volatiles aside from what the media is letting off. And this is the one that is interacting with Ralstonia solanaceorum. And so what you should be able to see here is that there is reduced canidiation. There's actually more kind of fluffy hyphal growth. Um, and uh, in quantifying this, we did see that there was a, a reduction, although it wasn't as severe as what we see here uh, on media plates. And so that just goes to show what we've seen again and again is that uh, on plant tissue, you know, microbes tend to act a lot differently than they do in uh, media. And so, uh, the one interesting thing that we did get from this analysis is we looked at aflatoxin production and it actually turns out that there's more aflatoxin being produced on the seeds that are uh, interacting with Ralstonia solanaceorum, which uh, suggests that this is probably a stressful interaction for Aspergillus flavus, but also suggests we should not use Ralstonia volatiles to try to suppress canidiation in storage or anything like that. I think more canidia and less aflatoxin is probably better. Uh, so I'm not going to stay on this too long, but uh, there's, this is a published paper, so if you'd like to read through it, um, and we can discuss later, I'll be around for quite a while, so uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm going to, in the sake of time, move forward and talk a little bit about the diffusible interactions I've been working on. And so, again, when I say diffusible interactions, this is not through airspace, but instead through semi-solid media in my case, but you can imagine this in uh, kind of an environmental context of being things that might move through aqueous solutions, um, you know, through pore space and soil. So here's just a picture to kind of give you the setup. Here is uh, Ralstonia solanaceorum and growing side by side with, again, Aspergillus flavus in this case. Um, and what we saw in this little interaction zone before they actually made physical contact are loads and loads of little bubbles, basically. And so the first time we saw this, we had no idea what these were. Um, but 
They looked a lot like chlamydospores, which had never been described for Aspergillus flavus before, and had hardly been described for Aspergillus species, period. So uh, just to remind those of you who don't know what chlamydospores are, uh, they're basically asexual resting structures. So they are uh, a spore in the context of uh, if you were to isolate a chlamydospore and leave it in the environment, once in, uh, environmental conditions were conducive for growth again, it would germinate and form a new fungal body. Uh, and so basically these chlamydospores, unlike the Canidia of Aspergillus flavus, uh, don't necessarily disperse in the wind and get blown around, but instead they'll just persist in whatever environment they were formed in, usually in soil is what we think of that uh, environment being, uh, but sometimes in plant tissue these things are formed as well. Uh, chlamydospores are, are generally thick wall. They, they tend to have more chitin in the cell wall, and that's thought just to be a protective mechanism to kind of help keep what's inside inside and safe. Uh, and they're often pigmented, but not always. Um, and they can be formed either terminally, meaning at the tip of a growing hyphae, or they can be grown, or formed uh, intercalated, meaning further back in a hyphae. So if there's a growing tip, they would be forming back here. And uh, it's known in different fungi that they can form in response to a variety of environmental cues. Uh, this can be you know, nutrient stress, changes in osmolarity and pH, uh, air quality has been implicated in some cases to initiate chlamydospore formation, uh, temperature definitely is one that's been seen again and again in fusarium species to affect chlamydospore development, and interkingdom signals. And I'm going to highlight this because that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, which is bacterial fungal interaction. So this is uh, work done by some researchers who showed that uh, Bacillus lipopeptide, so Bacillus subtilis, which many of you probably know to be a biocontrol agent, uh, produces a lipopeptide which is antifungal, which is why we think it's a great biocontrol agent, but also at lower concentrations, this induces chlamydospore formation uh, in a variety of fungi, and I'm just showing Fusarium grim in ER on here. So, uh, Moving forward, since we think these things might be chlamydospores, the first thing we wanted to do is see if this is a common response to all of the Ralstonia strains that we had at our disposal. And so we uh, basically set up this co-culture uh, interaction between uh, GMI 1000, which is the strain I'll be focusing on today. So if you see that, just know that's Ralstonia wild type throughout the rest of the talk, uh, as well as some of these other strains. Uh, it turns out that GMI 1000 is the only one that actually initiated chlamydospore development uh, to any substantial degree, and the rest of these really showed no signs of chlamydospores. So that suggested to us that this is definitely a strain-specific signal. Um, before I leave this slide, though, I do want to point out the strain K60. Uh, it is amongst the other ones that don't form chlamydospores, and we use this as kind of a negative control in the upcoming experiments. So uh, again, this is, this is work that's recently published, uh, but uh, what we did is we looked at that interaction zone, and I, I wanted to first characterize that these were actually chlamydospores. And so we looked for some of the hallmarks of chlamydospores that uh, other people have used to describe them in other fungi. And uh, what we found, <clears throat> again, were thickened cell walls. Uh, we found that these were polynucleate chlamydospores, meaning that there were many nuclei uh, kind of packed within this small space. Uh, and we also found that there was an accumulation of lipid bodies, uh, which has been suggested in other fungi to be an important part of the chlamydospore survival, uh, and it being that it's kind of like a, an energy storage that can be used when it wants to germinate and you know, occupy the space again. The last thing we were missing uh, to actually call these things spores was <coughs> proof that they form a new fungal body. And so uh, I isolated a couple of these things and put them into conducive environment, which is just rich media. And what you're seeing here is the chlamydospore, and then it just germinating hyphae out in every direction. Um, and this is, uh, again, from Aspergillus flavus, who, you know, we haven't seen chlamydospores from this species before. Uh, and just to anecdotally let you know, if you were to put a canidia in the same environment, you might see two germ tubes at most coming out of a spore. And so, uh, Comparing that to this, which is kind of a medusa of hyphae coming out, uh, I think that it's interesting to think that you know this might be a way that it can more quickly colonize an area if it has these, this dense energy reserve that can then just spew out hyphae and recolonize quickly under the right conditions. 
So at this point, we'll call them chlamydospores moving forward, um, but a, a better definition might just be mitospores, which would be an asexual spore. So uh, because we had seen a lot of work that suggested that uh, many bacteria can get into the fungal phallus, um, and we noticed that Ralstonia solanaceorum is kind of nestled nicely amongst many of these other described endofungal bacteria. We decided to uh, just use a GFP labeled strain of Ralstonia solanaceorum to see if it uh, did get inside of the fungus. Um, and in doing so, we did find that in some of these chlamydospores, we had, uh, you can see the GFP glowing, we had bacteria colonizing the chlamydospores. Um, and this got us a little bit more excited about this interaction, aside from it being just that it initiates chlamydospore formation, but instead might be kind of part of a more complex uh, symbiosis. And so, uh, in this next slide, I'll just show you that sometimes these things are pretty densely colonized. And so this is just a spinning Z-stack image uh, of one of these colonized chlamydospores. And not only is the chlamydospore colonized, but we also have a little bit of hyphae coming off the chlamydospore that has some bacteria in it. Um, and so I just wanted to show this as an example of kind of the extreme uh, case of bacteria inside the chlamydospore. Uh, but more often we saw less bacteria in there. And we can come back to this in discussion after. Um, so what we sought to do uh, after seeing these endofungal bacteria is try to figure out what that signal was that was uh, initiating the chlamydospore development um, to see if we can get an idea of, of how this uh, endosymbiosis might be occurring. So what we did is we decided to use, again, strain uh, GMI-1000 is the one that causes the, the chlamydospores to form, and K60 is one of the strains that does not. So we used uh, these two strains in a side-by-side -side imaging mass spec experiment. And, uh, very briefly, what imaging mass spec is, is basically collecting uh, mass signals from every point across an, uh, a culture plate. And then we can map those signals and pseudo-color where that compound is over the entire culture. Um, and so what we did is we did this experimentation and we were looking specifically for signals that were unique to GMI-1000, but that were not produced by uh, Ralstonia uh, strain K60. And uh, we did both co-culture and axionic culture because we were also wondering if there was some signal from the fungus that might initiate this uh, compound to be pr produced by Ralstonia. Uh, what we came up with was a much larger list of compounds than this, but this is abbreviated to show you the ones that were in fact different between the strains. Um, and what you can see here is there's a handful of them that GMI-1000 <coughs> produces and K60 really doesn't produce any of. And so these were our lead uh, targets that we wanted to go after. So what we did is uh, some follow-up mass spec experiments with uh, my collaborator, uh, Laura Sanchez, and uh, we found that there was a, a, a uh, specific uh, peptide sequence that we could pull out of uh, a tandem mass spec experiment that indicated there was amino acids incorporated into this compound. And so uh, I'll have you think back to when I said, remember NRPS is an amino acids, because we think of amino acids either being as part of proteins, or otherwise they generally aren't you know, uh, put into molecules, um, aside from molecules that are made by non-ribosomal peptide synthases. And so we had two places to look. So first thing we did was just blast the genome looking for this specific amino acid sequence. Um, and we didn't get any, any exact hits to that. And the other thing we did was uh, a variety of in silico analyses that include anti-smash uh, and peptopath, which are, again, just names, but we can talk about them later. But uh, basically what they do is they look for uh, non-ribosomal peptide synthases that might be able to incorporate these specific amino acids into a compound. And what we got from that analysis indicated uh, one non-ribosomal peptide synthase. Now, that on top of the fact that these two non-ribosomal peptide synthases have already had products described for them, uh, really started to indicate that this might be the right non-ribosomal peptide synthase that might be making it. Uh, and third, on top of that, if you search the K60 genome, this one is completely absent from the genome altogether. So that was really indicating that this one non-ribosomal peptide synthase <coughs> might be the one that we need to uh, target. So we did that. 
And with the help of Tiffany, uh, I was able to knock out just a part of this uh, non-ribosomal peptide synthase. And the reason we did just a part is this thing is huge. It's about 40 kb. It's the largest gene in the GMI 1000 genome, or set of genes in the, in the genome. Um, and so we decided to go with a, a more conservative approach, which was to just take the starter unit off of it. So the way these non-ribosomal peptide synthases work is they in initially incorporate one amino acid, and then those are subsequently added on at each of these A domains. And so we got rid of its ability to start making the compound, which in theory should stop the rest of the process. Um, and it seems to have done just that. So you're looking here at uh, the mutant that no longer is able to make this compound, and it uh, no longer causes chlamydospores to develop, and this is just the control of the wild type. And also, we did subsequent mass spec uh, experiments and showed that we lost two of the signals that uh, were indicated by that sequence tag, but we didn't lose this other signal that is uh, unrelated to it, that did not have that same tag. Um, and so at this point, we decided to name this compound <coughs> Rosolomycin, after Rostonia solanaceara, uh, and the genes that we've, we've called them as RMYA, which are just Rostolomycin uh, biosynthetic genes. And uh, we believe that it's a lipopeptide that incorporates a fatty acid at this first uh, activating domain, and then subsequently adds uh, uh, amino acids to the other parts of, of the uh, final product. So, next thing we wanted to do is see okay, we know that the bacteria can get into these chlamydospores. We wanted to see if the mutant was uh, now incapable of invading the fungal uh, hyphae. And so, what we did is more confocal experiments. Uh, we did find that with the mutant that no longer produces Rosolomycin, that there were still some bacteria inside of hyphae. Um, but I will say there were substantially less than uh, you would expect if it had no impact. Um, so we can again and again find these bacteria in the chlamydospores, um, but it was very difficult to find them in the hyphae. So I would say that it isn't the only thing affecting bacterial entry, but that it does potentially play a, a role in helping the bacteria get in and specifically getting them into chlamydospores. So another part of this work that we, or that I, I, I did was uh, to see if this was a common response. So all of that work was just with Aspergillus flavus, but I wanted to see if this was a common response amongst other fungi as well. So I tested over 30 fungi, a lot of them being Aspergillus species, uh, but also Fusarium and Verticillium and Trichoderma. Um, and basically the idea is I wanted to get kind of a broad swath of, of fungi and see if this was a common uh, occurrence, which was the, the formation of chlamydospores in response to this compound. So testing the, the delta RMYA mutant, the one that can't produce rosolomycin versus the wild type, I found that a majority of these fungi did in fact produce significantly more chlamydospores in response to the uh, wild type strain that produces the compound. And I want to just highlight a few of them, which are these fusarium species, because part of the subsequent work that I did is coming out of these experiments, which is, uh, in this case, everything on the right in each of these plates is the wild type bacterium, and everything on the left is the mutant that does not produce rosolomycin. And you can see again and again that the fusarium species tend to make pigments around the uh, colonies that are making uh, rosolomycin. And so this takes us kind of to the next part of my work, which is looking at how the fungi are responding to this signal. So again, we used imaging mass spec experiments to uh, try to understand this interaction a little bit more. Uh, this is just to show you some of that pigmentation. And uh, in this case, we're looking at Fusarium fugicaroi or Gibberella fugicaroi, uh, which is the causal agent of uh, foolish seedling disease. Um, and so, in this case, you can see again that the mutant that doesn't produce rosolomycin doesn't seem to induce as much of a response as does the wild type. And so we took these, excised these colonies, put them on a, a multi plate and imaged them. And what we got, again, is kind of a variety of uh, signals or masses that you can target either to fungi or to the bacteria. Um, but what we were looking for in this case was not uh, specifically to one or the other, but what was really just in this interaction zone between GMI 1000 
And since this is colored, this makes it a lot easier because if we map a compound over, oop, over the colored area, I'll just keep talking and see if it comes back on. <laughs> So if we map this over, over the colored area, um, we can really do some kind of, I'll call it co-localization experiments basically, which is to say uh, in that area, we saw a couple of very, very distinct uh, masses coming out just in that uh, GMI 1000 interaction, but not with the mutant, or not so much with the mutant. Um, and what we, the good thing about using this system is that we know a lot about Fusarium Fujik Roy's uh, biosynthetic capacities. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we chose to focus on this interaction. And we know that bicaverin is, is a red pigment that this uh, fungus produces. And in fact, we can see, um, so this is the, the mass of bicaverin. And so this is the mass plus hydrogen, plus potassium, and plus sodium, um, all localizing to that GMI 1000 interaction zone area. And not so much in the interaction with the mutant that doesn't produce russellomycin. Um, and so, we, we took these experiments and we, we wanted to further look at uh, that interaction between Fusarium fujicoroi and Ralstonia solanaceorum, knowing that these chlamydospores are forming also in response. Um, so under some conditions, what we found is that when we induce chlamydospore formation, we also get uh, just a drastic accumulation of bicabrin inside of these chlamydospores, uh, which hasn't been described for uh, Fusarium fujicoroi before. Um, generally, when they've uh, done uh, studies on bicaverin production, you see it kind of accumulating randomly in hyphae. Uh, but it seems, as you can see in this picture here, that uh, more often than not, we get bicaverin accumulating in chlamydospores, and uh, still a little bit in hyphae, but uh, very generally, you can spot the chlamydospores pretty easily just by looking for red in these co-cultures. So we took some of the uh, existing knowledge of bicaverin uh, regulation, we looked at uh, some of the work done by uh, Dr. Philip Feynman on uh, bicaverin regulation in response to nitrogen. And what uh, he had shown is that under low nitrogen conditions, you get lots of bicaverin. So this is just the fungus alone under low nitrogen conditions. And under high nitrogen conditions, you basically get a suppression of bicaverin production. So we took this system and tried to repeat it with some of our uh, experiments to see if we could override the effect of nitrogen regulation. So what you're looking at here is basically these same cultures, but then treated with media that I'd grown, uh, Ralst or, I'm sorry, the media that I used to grow Ralstonia in, but in this case there was no Ralstonia grown in it. And then when we added supernatants from uh, cultures of Ralstonia that produce Ralstolomycin, we saw a drastic increase in red pigmentation in this media, and in the mutant that does not produce Ralstolomycin, or the supernatants from the mutant, uh, we didn't see a drastic increase. So this kind of suggests that Ralstolomycin is uh, kind of specifically overriding this, this nitrogen regulation um, and causing this uh, bicaverin accumulation in the media. And so we looked at some of the, the transcription of the genes involved in bicaverin biosynthesis. Big one is the polyketide synthase that assembles the backbone of the, of the compound. And you can see kind of at day two a little bit of induction of, of some of these genes, but really at day three, which is when we uh, took those pictures and also when we collected some of the chemical data, um, we really see a, a overproduction of this in the GMI 1000 strain, but not in the mutant that doesn't produce Ralstolomycin or in the media controls. Um, and then this is further validated with HPLC data, um, which is interesting because in, the, in these experiments, you might be able to see it looks a little bit darker under the uh, normally uh, inducing conditions. Um, and we actually saw that with the HPLC data that even in conditions where it's already producing a lot of bicaverin, it's producing a bunch more bicaverin in response to uh, Ralstolomycin. And under conditions where it's usually repressive, it's, again, producing a lot more bicaverin. Um, so this seems like this is, uh, you know, again, overriding this, this nitrogen regulation. So we're starting to think about how this might uh, impact the interaction between the two, why the fungus might be producing bicaverin. Uh, there's a decent amount of work that's shown that bicaverin has bioactive properties, that it's antifungal, 
antiprotozoal, antitumoral, even some work that it's uh, nematicidal. And there's one body of uh, literature that suggests that it's antibacterial, and that's uh, mainly looking at uh, E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa and uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And so, you know, they're looking for antibiotics against human pathogens. So in this case, we're actually looking at a plant pathogen. Um, so what I did was uh, took supernatants from uh, wild-type Fusarium fujigroi, and we also have a mutant that does not produce bicabrin. Um, the, the polyketide synthase gene has been deleted from this mutant. Uh, we took supernatants from conditions that are normally inducing bicabrin production, and then put Ralstonia in, uh, incubated them, or incubated them for uh, three days, and then see or, or examine what we're able to pull back out. And what we found in these supernatants is that we do get a, a significant reduction in the amount of uh, bacteria that we can recover from the uh, wild type uh, Fusarium fujicoroi cultures uh, relative to the mutant that cannot produce the cavern. Uh, then we tried to uh, look at uh, how pure the cavern might affect Ralstonia solanaceae. And so I've plotted here different concentrations for you, and uh, you can see that in general you do get an increase in killing. Uh, relative to uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, which is just the carrier that uh, this compound is soluble in. Um, and so there is a, a difference between these two curves, suggesting that bicabrin is, uh, to some degree, toxic to Ralstonia solanaceae. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to wrap up now and, and just go through some of the, the summary statements here. Uh, so in general, I would say that we can it's safe to say that Ralstonia interacts with fungi, period. Um, but it does it in many ways. You know, it, it interacts with them through volatile signaling. It interacts with them through some of the diffusible metabolites like Ralstolomycin. Um, some of the other metabolites that have been described by other groups um, have been shown to impact fungi, um, but one of them is a siderophore, and so that would be through you know, effects of uh, accumulating uh, iron and keeping the fungus from getting it. Um, but then there's also interactions that uh, really have not been looked at with Ralstonia before, which are these endosymbioses, which might have implications in the field for survival uh, or for uh, how the fungus might, inter or, I'm sorry, how the bacteria might interact with plants. Um, and so I think there's lots to think about after this research um, and to continue forward with. Uh, but it's definitely uh, interesting to say or to see that sometimes these things are multi-directional. So with the volatile work we did, uh, this was a two-way signaling. So both the bacterium and the fungus were affected. And in a lot of volatile studies you'll, you'll read through in bacterial fungal volatile interactions, you'll find that uh, generally it's at least what's been documented as a one-way interaction. One bacterium makes something that affects fungal growth or affects fungal sporulation. Um, and really the opposite way has not been uh, described so much. And part of that I might attribute to Ralstonia's uh, showiness. You know, it, it makes pigments and it, it makes EPS. So there's things to see. I think generally with bacteria, there's not a lot to see, uh, you know, on a macroscopic scale. And so I, I think that it would be interesting as people move forward to really start looking at both ways. And uh, what you might get at is that there are common signals that both microbes are producing that might actually be functioning on both sides of, of the interaction. Um, but I, I do think that it's important to start thinking about pathogens like Ralstonia solanaceae um, and how their interactions outside of the plant host might affect their lifestyle. Uh, whether it's with other fungi that just might be in the environment. As you can see here, Ralstonia interacts with not just one fungus, but a lot of fungi. And so this suggests that this might be some kind of uh, evolved interaction that it, it, you know, it knows there's fungi in its, its environment and it's trying to interact with them and potentially survive in them. Um, so I think it's important to start looking at some of these uh, interactions that don't necessarily involve plant health directly, but might involve plant health uh, on a, a larger scale. Um, and then I, I also just want to say that, you know, we do see that fungi are responding to Ralstonia solanaceae. Uh, they're changing their, their morphology, their morphology, they're changing their uh, uh, dispersal in terms of the conidiation and the volatile interactions. 
but they're also, in many cases, uh, changing metabolically. So they're responding to it either by trying to make uh, compounds like the cavern, which might actually be trying to fight off the bacterium. Um, and so I think that this is uh, just ripe for further study um, with Ralstonia and other fungi, but other plant pathogenic bacteria and other fungi, whether they be plat uh, pathogens or not. So um, just a couple of concluding remarks that I'd like to just throw out there is that uh, you know, some of the stuff I've gotten into already, that it might be a good idea to start thinking about some of these uh, polymicrobial interactions in, in regards to plant health as well as human health. Um, instead of looking at a host pathogen interaction alone, uh, we need to start thinking a little more holistically about everyone who's in an environment, which I know is a daunting task. And uh, I'm not saying that I've done that, but I think that's a good idea for you know, the future of plant health, human health and uh, ecosystem studies, and so um, it's definitely something that I've uh, come to again and again in this research I've done over the past couple of years. And uh, really I think that this language of intermicrobial interactions uh, needs to move beyond antibiosis. I think that we need to start looking at how compounds are affecting uh, microbes on a, uh, a sub-lethal level. Um, because there's lots of uh, evidence that there is interactions such as this, um, that, or such as the, the Russellomycin interaction, that uh, are, you know, it is an antifungal. If I put enough of that Russellomycin on there, the fungi just don't grow. But if you look further out in the colony where it's experiencing a lower concentration, that's where all these chlamydospores are forming and potentially the endosymbiosis is going on. So. I think that there's a lot to be looked at outside of antibiosis. And uh, this is just, I think, obvious, but I'll state it anyway, is that this, everything I've done has been in plates. And so I think uh, that's a great start to understanding some of these interactions. But again, this is, everything is going to be context dependent, just like plant disease is context dependent. And so your environment, who else is in the environment, are really going to affect some of these outcomes. And so I think a lot of the work that's done in plates uh, also should probably, at some point, move into a more natural environment to make sure that these things can be validated. Um, and so that's, I think, the end of what I will be saying. These are my acknowledgments. <laughs> Every one of you is listed in here, so uh, thank you for coming on a Thursday. Uh, but I just I abbreviated a little bit to make it a little more clear. So I'd obviously like to acknowledge my committee, uh, and that includes Nancy for let me hang out in your lab for five years and do all sorts of fun work. Um, Caitlin, uh, Caitlin in France, thanks for being on my committee. She's in that video recorder. Uh, Cameron Curry, uh, Audrey Gash, and Ann Pringle. Um, you, know, you guys have all provided great uh, insights into my work and helped me a lot in kind of tackling some of the difficult issues with it. Um, I would like to thank everyone personally in the Keller lab, but I won't go through this whole list. These are you know, members past and present. Um, but really, I, you know, I, I do need to thank Jim Wu. He uh, helped me a ton throughout my PhD, and so I need to give him credit for doing that. Like he was, he was a, uh, I think people call him daddy in some cases. I'll call him that too. Like he's, he's been a great help uh, throughout time. And uh, I also want to thank my collaborators. Uh, Laura Sanchez really helped me with the imaging mass spec work and then let me go to her lab and do the fusarium interaction work in her lab. Um, and so I actually got to do it myself, which was a great experience. Um, her, her PI at the time that we started this work was Peter Dorstein, who kind of pioneered a lot of the microbial imaging mass spec work. Uh, Tiffany, thank you for everything throughout the years. Tiffany helped me with Ralstonia transformation, Ralstonia literature, Ralstonia plant assays. We did all sorts of stuff with Ralstonia. So, um, and I, I do point out Tiffany specifically, uh, but really the Allen Lab, they, everyone has helped me in the Allen Lab throughout the five years I've been here. Um, they are the Ralstonia Lab, for those of you who don't know. So that, uh, that connection was vital to, to me getting through all of this. Um, and then I also want to thank collaborators who uh, aren't necessarily a part of this work, but uh, were a big part of other projects that I've worked on. Um, and then, last but not least, my beautiful family, who most of whom were developed in Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> Carrie came with me from California, uh, and Baron and my daughter Huxley, 
uh, were born here, so now I'm, I'm forever connected to this state despite its winters. So, um, and then of course, uh, I, will, I will definitely thank um, my funding sources and the Department of Plant Pathology for uh, putting up with me for five years. So with that, I'll take any questions that anyone has, and yeah. Um, have you looked at whether the uh, bicabrin that's produced by the fusarium, whether bicabrin um, affects Ralstonius production of the Ralstolomycin? Is it? Um, I haven't directly, no. Um, so that would be actually interesting to see. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good thing. I, I was going to say, you know, we kind of might be able to see that with the imaging mass spec experiments. Um, but I will say that because Ralstonia produces so much EPS, um, it actually is a very difficult thing to do imaging mass spec on because it requires uh, a matrix of uh, uh, organic acids to kind of be dried down on top of it and it just holds a bunch of water in that EPS which makes it kind of a black hole for imaging in some cases. So I, I guess I'd say we could look there and we could see if there's a difference but um, it, it wouldn't be conclusive. I think it'd be better to do a different set of experiments to look at that. I was really intrigued by the um, table of fungal species that you tested for um, minospore production. It, it, you had things like morels on there. Yeah. And so how many of those are no, were already known to make these structures, and how many are you discovering that for the first time? So for most of the Aspergillae, first time description for, for clematospores. Um, and I think uh, that was partially because they just don't really form them under kind of vaccine and culture that anyone's described yet. There was one Aspergillus, uh, I think Aspergillus parasiticus, there's uh, some paper where it basically sounds, it was I think from the 70s, sounds like they just left a culture sitting for a while and at the bottom of the culture they described what they called clematospores, uh, but that was the one Aspergillus clematospore paper I could find. Um, Fusarium, they're known to produce them by and large. So a lot of the ones that I did use do produce clematospores in general. Um, and a lot of them had overlap with, uh, or the reason I used some of them was because they overlapped with some of that work that was done with bacillus, um, just to see if we saw a similar response between Bengusin, which is the bacillus lipopeptide, and our lipopeptide. Um, yeah. Did you test any basidiomycetes? Or? Yes, uh, the one basidiomycete we tested uh, was Rhizoctonia, and so uh, we did see uh, clematospore development Did there. Huh. Yeah. Well, I don't think we've known that that rise up before. Uh, I think yeah. they were in the bacillus oh, papers as well, yeah. Okay. So again, it's, it's kind of this interconnected <laughs> interactions where they've been described in some cases, but uh, yeah. But it seems March, a really general response though. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was interesting to see that they were just yeah. all yeah. doing it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, do you know what's happening to these populations within the fungi? Are they growing rapidly? That's a good question. Are being digested by fungi? Yeah, it's a, it's a question that is not answered, uh, to give you the very general answer. But uh, we have some speculation about it. I and mean, considering the populations that we see sometimes in these that are very densely colonized, um, my guess is that they are able to multiply in there. Um, because I would just be amazed if that many snuck in there and then just hung out in, inside the clematospore. Um, but we don't have any good data to say that's definitely happening versus elsewise. So, yeah, I, I think it's a great question, though, that hopefully we'll get to at some point. Yeah. Um, were you able, able, ever able to notice if the uh, clematospores that were colonized by, by Ralstonia, are they able to germinate? in the same fashion as the ones that are not colonized? Another great question. Uh, so it's uh, relatively difficult to isolate these clematospores um, because they've all, uh, in all the fungi that I tested, they're intercalated, meaning that they're just kind of stuck in with hyphae. And they're actually developing from already mature hyphae, so I can't really excise them well without hand-picking them. So the ones that I showed germinating were picked with a really fine uh, needle out of a culture and put into another uh, you know, in all other culture environment. Um, and so I haven't been able to directly look at that because every clematospore isn't colonized too. 
Um, and so the difficulty is first saying, okay, I have to use a GFP labeled strain to show that it's colonized, but then it's on a slide and then to go back and try to collect it is something I've uh, not done. Actually, I haven't tried that because it seems so difficult. So, um, but yeah, I think it's a good question. It comes up again and again you know, when Nancy's presented this work too. Sorry, can you repeat um, that again? So, Brownstonia and Fusarium, like in banana or tomato, is there any evidence that they occur together or that one occurs after the other? Or? Yeah, so I think there have been, uh, it's been documented that they can co occur on a field site, um, but I, I don't have any knowledge of you know, someone doing a controlled study of you know, co inoculating them and seeing what the output was of that infection. Since they're both causing vascular wilt, um, I think that that would be a hard thing to tease apart who's doing what if you're looking at the plant response to them. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know how that would impact plant health overall, because um, also it could be antagonistic. You know, Maybe Rostonia wants to keep it out so it produces some lipopeptide that kill, and then, then it gets to invade the plant. But I, I, I can't say directly. Yeah. Were, do you know of any instances that the Rustonia is colonizing the spores um, in a stressful condition or not stressful condition? Is it in any condition? Yeah, so the conditions that all this work was done in was uh, actually in a, a rich media that is a happy place for Rustonia to grow and thrive. Um, I have done some experiments actually just putting them together in water um, just to see if that nutrient limitation enhanced chromospore or yeah, chromospore invasion. Um, but uh, in that experiment, when I did the compo for microscopy, I didn't see really an abundance of uh, chromospore invasion. I saw just a few chromospores that had um, some bacteria in them. Um, so that's one thing that we want to kind of look at a little bit more is how does uh, you know nutrient limitation affect that because that was my thought too is that yeah if you have less happy environment you would think they'd want to get in the fungus and potentially eat what's in there um, but I don't have data that supports that so. any other questions um are the are you able to tell whether the Ralstonia cells are like swimming like free floating the cytoplasm of the chlamydospore are they in like vacuole enclosures yeah I, it looks like they're kind of free floating in cytoplasm um, from the confocal experiments I've done. Um, in the one case, uh, like where I showed that spinning chlamydospore, there are definitely some areas where it seems like they're excluded from as well. Um, it could be cool to do TEM and see if. Yeah, so the TEM I think would be the way not only to see kind of where they are in the cell, but also potentially to capture them invading a cell. So um, there's been relatively few documented uh, endosymbiosis events. I think one that I know of where they use TEM just to show, oh yeah, we caught it halfway in between, in and out. And in that case they showed that chitinases were involved in kind of that invasion. Um, so. I think that would be the way to go for kind of further examination of how it's able to get into those groups. You never did a like a nucleus staining that be in a nucleus Uh So I, I did, but the bacteria will also stain um, with, with host. So yeah, you just see blue. Blue. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of blue. A lot of it, yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Joe one more time.